calm awareness of the present moment. Not in the past, not in the future. Right now, in this time and space, take a few deep, long breaths. And check your posture, your fingers, your shoulders, your hands, your neck, your shoulders, all relaxed, peaceful. And again, breathing in, breathing out. Set an intention to concentrate, to focus, to keep the mind balanced. And to take this commitment for the next 60 minutes, I'm going to do two minutes of chanting. And these are some universal peace chants. you might not be able to understand as the chanting is in Sanskrit. But you may develop an intention of joy, of gratitude, of peace as I chant. Om Sahana Babatu Sahana Hunaktu Sahaviriam Karavahai Tejasvina Vadhita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Ambritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Nira Mayaha Sarve Bhadrani Bhashantu Ma kashchit, Ma kashchit. Dukha Bhag Bhave Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Welcome friends. Welcome to this one hour lecture or a one hour session where we are going to discuss about that how yoga can bring about healing, collective and individual healing. A little bit about myself before I start although I will not spend a lot of time in introducing myself. 
I am Jeenal Mehta and I run this yoga center in Thailand. I have been teaching yoga since the past 15 years, have traveled to various countries and taught people from various different backgrounds. Born in India, in a traditional Indian family, a Hindu family, where yoga was always a way of life. The philosophy, the scriptures, the books were always present since I was a child. And there was an attraction towards this knowledge. And when I grew up, I understood that this attraction was more of a commitment, more of dedication, which eventually I wanted to share with the people of this world. So here I am, and I'll do my best that in these next 45 to 60 minutes, I could give you something very valuable. Okay. So before, just check everybody, keep your mic always mute if possible. Okay, that would be nice. Now, I think some of you are already yoga students and you have done some yoga asana, correct? How many of you are yoga teachers over here? Teachers who teach yoga. Very nice. And how many of you are yoga aspirants who have been doing asanas already? Learning different asanas, isn't it? Yes, some of the hands going up. Today, we will understand yoga in four different aspects. One, yoga as philosophy. Two, yoga as psychology. Three, yoga as physiological aspect. And the fourth is yoga as a lifestyle. Okay. And then understand what we really mean by this word healing. What are we trying to heal? So you might say, some of you that I'm trying to heal some physical ailments. And that's what people do, right? They have some pain and aches or they have obesity. So they are trying to heal some of these physical ailments, diseases and imbalances in the body. Some people might say, I'm trying to heal my anxiety my depression, my loneliness. And some people might say that I'm trying to cope up with my stress. Yoga helps me to reduce my stress, my worries. And then some people might give a spiritual explanation that yoga helps me to connect with myself. It brings more awareness. So there could be so many explanations. For you, healing could be something personal. Healing could be something relative. One person might be healing from loss or death of a loved one. And some other person might be healing from some financial loss. Some person might be healing from some identity crisis and so on. So let us see in brief, how can yoga heal you in different ways? When you look at yoga 
from all the angles, not just one perspective, but different perspectives. So first, yoga as philosophy. In our ancient times, especially in India, the Indian subcontinent, which was widespread. Right now, India that you see in the map, it is an English name before it was called Bharata. This Bharata extended. It was a huge subcontinent. And in those ancient times, when certain scriptures, important scriptures came into existence, there were people, like even today there are, even in that time, there were people who were thinkers, who thought deeply about life and existence. What is my purpose over here? Why am I living? What am I supposed to do in this world? And who are all these people? What is my role? And these thinkers were not very happy with a general explanation that you're supposed to grow up, work, get some livelihood, some money, raise children, and go through the cycle of life and then die. They were not very happy. They wanted to know more about life. So they set an inquiry. They set some arguments. They tried to exchange their thoughts and ideas and opinions and wanted to also understand why there is pain, why there is suffering. Even though we want happiness, we want to be happy, we want to be peaceful, we want to be joyful, then why there is this pain? Why do we suffer and become sad? And why do people die? So there were many, many questions. And then how to come out of the suffering? Is it possible? Is there a systematic method, a way to come out of suffering? This physical suffering, this mental suffering, the psychological suffering that every day we face, right from morning <laughs> to night, you know, we are in this rigmarole, in this turmoil of life where we are experiencing pain and how to come out of it. So these thinkers, they set an inquiry and then a few philosophical systems were formed. In the ancient Indian subcontinent, there were in total six orthodox philosophies and four non-orthodox philosophies. In total, 10 philosophies. Some of you might be already knowing. Okay. Buddhist philosophy is one of the system of non-orthodox Indian philosophy. And yoga is one of the orthodox philosophy. Then we also have Vedanta, which is one more type of philosophy. Vedanta is an orthodox philosophy. Then there is Sankhya. Don't worry if you don't know the spelling or the pronunciation because these are some systems maybe you have never heard. So Sankhya philosophy, Vedanta philosophy, yoga philosophy. In this way, there were total 10 philosophies. Now to understand yoga as a philosophy, you must also have an understanding of other philosophies as well. Just for you to understand how does mango taste, you must also know how does an apple taste? How does a banana taste? Then you would exactly know the place of mango in the kingdom of fruits, isn't it? So in the same way, 
in order to understand yoga as a philosophy you must also have a brief understanding of other philosophies in order to have this comparative analysis so this philosophy is a viewpoint a point of view that these thinkers came up with they came up with a solution to the humanity and they told us that think in this way look at life in this way look at your pain your problems and your troubles with a certain perspective because when you look at your life with a certain perspective then you would be able to solve it you would be able to have a solution but when you look at life just with your own perspective which might not be wrong but if you take support of a verified philosophy if you take support of certain systems which are verified in which there are already verified arguments and solutions so when you study when you learn then you can play games with your experiences of life so sadness has come loss has come trauma has come now how can i look at trauma how can i look at the sadness how can i look at death how can i look at my own losses in life so philosophy teaches you to look at all these shortcomings in a certain way in order to create fulfillment it is the way you look at life okay so philosophy helps you to look at half glass full because our human mind usually sees the half glass empty but yoga philosophy helps you to look at it in a positive way so let us have a brief understanding that under this yoga philosophy what topics are discussed under yoga philosophy the concept of dharma or duty what is my purpose my duty in life that is deeply discussed it is analyzed and then a human being comes to an understanding that this is the purpose of, of my life let me live my life with this particular purpose so the concept of dharma which gives you a direction in life in certain yoga scriptures like bhagavad gita it is mentioned when you get some direction you get some stability some foundation in life otherwise you are wandering from one part of the world to the other part of the world from one place to the other place with so many thoughts many many goals many many things to achieve but when you get one definite path and one direction then you will have focus you will have concentration you will be able to achieve that because you have set all your emotional energy in that direction so yoga philosophy helps you to channelize your emotional energy with the goal that you have set and it will help you to find out your goals the second part it discusses in the philosophy is the law of impermanence that everything is changeful nothing is permanent so there is a profound study about the material consciousness and this consciousness that we call it as self the self or this awareness or we call it as the pure consciousness which never ever goes through change but 
the physical material body goes through change. All the people around you also goes through change. All the circumstances in this matrix of time and space also goes through change. Everybody is under this flux of constant change, including the trees, including the ocean, the sky. So this entire nature, animals and humans are in constant flux of change, including your thoughts. Your thoughts are always changing, okay? In the morning, you had some thought about yourself and now these thoughts about yourself have changed right now. You had some thought about your friend, but now the thoughts have changed. Your opinion, your perspective has changed. So the mind is changeful, the intellect is changeful. Your opinions, your ideas, is all changeful. Everything that is material is bound to change. And now this philosophy of impermanence in yoga brings about a sublimation. It brings about a sublimation in the form of acceptance. The more you understand, the more you dig deeper into the subject of change and you observe through your experiences that how rapid things are changing, then with this observation and analysis, it will help you to come to a point of acceptance. And this point of acceptance brings clarity. And when I say clarity, this clarity is freedom. There is a sense of freedom from the psychological and mental suffering that we are always fighting that why people change? Why things change? Why did I change? Why my body changed? Why the situations changed? Yesterday, my loved one was there. Today, that loved one is gone. Why there is this change? There is this constant fight that we are going through every day. But when you start learning, studying in the same time, you start applying it experientially, you would understand there is a difference. You would understand that there is a difference between this material consciousness that is bound to change and this awareness that we call it as the self, there is a difference. There are two things to understand in yoga philosophy. One is the self, the awareness that never changes. We call it as the witness, the observer. And the other is that which is the world outside including this body. Anything that you don't have control over is outside, including this body. So there is a beautiful, profound science within yoga that speaks about the material consciousness and that which is immaterial consciousness the self. Now, this gives you immense strength to face all the troubles of life. And then you would find yourself up on that mountain cliff and you're looking down below at the whole world, the whole life, and there is a game going on and you are the observer, you are the witness, you're observing. So, Another part of yoga philosophy is the philosophy of karma, which is action. Yoga teaches you how to perform your actions. Yoga never teaches you to renounce any actions. Yoga never teaches you to give away 
your family life, your work life, your professional life, your career, your aspirations, your ambitions. But in fact, yoga teaches you how to excel in your professional life, in your family life, in your personal life, using this yoga philosophy of action, of work. How can I work? I want to learn a way that whenever I make any actions, it does not lead me to any suffering. I don't want to suffer. Because when you analyze properly, every action that you're making is always taking you to the second action, and then the third action, then the fourth action. And then there is a line, a chain of action in which you feel trapped. And every action leading to the other action always has some or the other problems in it. Now, yoga does not give you a promise that there will be no problems. But yoga tells you, if you apply this philosophy, when you work, when you make any action, the problem might not go. But your suffering, the way you are suffering because of a problem, that will certainly go away. That guarantee yoga gives you. Not the guarantee of that the problem will go away. But your reaction, your response system towards the problem will change. How you manage the problem, how you look at the problem, that will be helpful. So what I'm trying to say over here is that in yoga, pain or problem is inevitable. But once you learn the yoga of action, then suffering becomes a choice. Suffering is a choice. Pain is not a choice. You have pain. Something is hurting. The hand is in pain or the neck is in pain. The shoulder is in pain. But now how is your response system towards this pain? This is an art to be learned. That other person, which is an external source of pain, you cannot avoid that. Because if you avoid one person, tomorrow some second person will come. If you avoid that second person, the third person will come, isn't it? In life, so many people come and go. And they keep on coming. And when they keep on coming, they give you some or the other kind of pain. How many people you will run away from? So now learn the art of how to manage people, how to manage their emotions, how to manage your emotions, how to work in this world and still be happy, still not suffer. Is it magic? No, it's not magic. It is just a way of looking at things. So in yoga of action, in karma yoga, Sri Krishna, who is the yogi, the master, the teacher teaches that work in such a way that you will never suffer. You should never suffer. But what we are doing, when we are working, we are always suffering. Dizendo que o problema, um dos problemas mais graves do. Sorry. So. Yoga is a philosophy and it has these aspects. As I said, the first, the concept of duty, the second, the concept of impermanence, and there is the concept of action, how to make the action, karma yoga. And there is a whole big list of several tools. You can look at these things as tools. There is also Ishvara. Okay? Ishvara means a source, a power, a higher power. Okay? 
I'm not going to uh, you know, translate it into a religious sense like God, but Ishwara means something that is higher, that is a source from where you have come, from where I have come, from where the entire creation has come. So there is a systematic study within yoga philosophy of this source as well. Okay. Well, let's move ahead. Yoga as psychology. Now, what is this psychology? Let's look at human psychology. What is this human psychology? I have a psychology. You have a psychology, right? We all humans have our own psychology. What do we mean by this psychology? There are different streams of psychology. Within the study of psychology, there are seven types of psychology. Isn't it industrial psychology, educational psychology? There is developmental psychology, clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, so many different types of psychology. But let us try to understand right now with a few fundamentals. When I say I have a psychology, it means that since childhood, whatever I experienced, it has become a part of my memory. It has become a part of my subconscious mind. It is ingrained. Whatever I experienced since childhood, with my parents, in my school, and then I grew up, I met my friends, I went out to work, I had relationships. So all this collectively, it became my experience and then it became my memory. And some memories, they remain with you and they are just there. Whenever you want, you can pull this out in order to relate with this world, in order to relate with yourself, with your emotions, in order to cognize everything, isn't it? So all the experiences, they become your memory. They become a part of your subconscious mind. And now with these experiences and memories, now when you behave, you speak, you talk, you listen to people, you walk, you eat, the way you respond, the way you react. Everything is based on this subconscious mind holding this memory. So there is depression, there is sadness because in the subconscious mind and also the conscious mind, there is a bag, a big bag of memories, which is forming your behavior which is forming your reaction and response systems. And this is what we mean by memory and psychology. And, you know, memory is something very complex. When we talk of memory, psychology is related with it. You cannot separate memory and psychology. Okay? Because if you don't have memory, there would be no psychology. So when you talk of psychology, it is very, very complex because there is also the cyclic psychology. The cyclic psychology. Or you can call it as the cyclic memory. So in our galaxies, everything is rotating, isn't it? The earth is going around rotating. And as it rotates once, twice, thrice, four times, five times, it is creating memories. Within your body, there is atomic memory as well. And if you look at the creation, whether it is the earth, the sun, the galaxies, 
our own physiology, our own body, our own anatomy, the atoms and the molecules and everything, everything goes in cyclic motion. <laughs> okay. So it repeats again and again and again and again. It keeps repeating like Christmas just came. You have already celebrated Christmas last year and you have already celebrated Christmas many, many times and it has come again. This is cyclic memory. Now you have a psychology towards Christmas. You have psychology towards the smell of the food. There is some particular memory you hold towards the Santa Claus and gifts and winter and snow. I don't know which parts you're living in, but I think in Brazil it's summer when it's Christmas. So you see, you have a way of looking at things which is only formed by your psychology. And this is something that yoga explores. Yoga explores all types of psychology by first making you aware about your own psychology, your own behavior with this scriptural study, a scriptural study wherein some form of reflection is needed, some form of effort is needed, wherein you understand that why do I behave in such a way? Why do I act in such a way? Why am I angry or why am I depressed? Because if you don't understand why you are depressed and you want to come out of depression without understanding the cause, it would be just like suppression. But yoga helps you to go to the roots of everything and then you would be able to heal yourself through this understanding when you understand what is depression. Why am I depressed? Is it just a chemical imbalance? It is just a physiological imbalance or there is something more profound, something more deeper than it. So when you take yoga as psychology, it helps you in many different ways. Now there is this, also the subject of collective psychology. Okay. What is this collective psychology? And how can this help us in healing? There is individual psychology because when I understand myself, when I understand my mind, I can heal. I can come out of the problems, the trauma, the grief, when I understand the self. This is individual psychology. What is this collective psychology? Collective psychology is based on share and care, on altruism, on kindness. I'll give you an example. When for example, you are somewhere with your friend and your friend offers you some food. Before eating, the friend offers you some food. How would you feel? You would feel loved. You would feel cared, isn't it? Let's say you're picking up something heavy. Second example. And two more other friends join and they give you their helping hand to lift up something that is heavy. How would you feel? You would feel happy. You would feel supported, isn't it? In the same way, when there is a little child at home, okay, let's say a five-year-old child, a 10-year-old child, when the child returns back home, the child sees that there is mommy, there is daddy, 
you know. And when I return back home, the mummy gives me water. Mummy gives me food. She changes my clothes. You know, the child might be knowing that the, that the child is making a mess. He or she is making a mess. But you see, mummy cares for me. That's why mummy picks up my dirty shoes and socks and clothes because I'm so special. You know, for the child, the child thinks I'm the prince and the princess of my mummy and papa, isn't it? So the child forms the psychology since childhood. The child sees how the mom cares and how the dad cares. And there is this nurturing. There is care. There is pampering. There is affection. Isn't it? So the child develops this understanding that I'm not alone. And in fact, this is the psychology that we all have it since childhood because the mother has held us in her arms. The father has held us in his arms. We know what is protection. We know what is love. We know what is sharing and caring. When I fell down, my mother helped me to get up again. When I was wounded, you know, I made a drama. I started crying to show mommy that how much I'm hurt, although the hurt might be very little, but the child knows how to make a big drama because the child is seeking attention. So this is what the child is asking. And not only a child, but even we as adults, we are asking the same thing. And why we are asking the same thing? Because it is ingrained in our psychology since childhood. That attention seeking, which we call, is something which society says, no, it's wrong. Attention seeking, liking, over affection is wrong. But this is what we are seeking. We are seeking this because this is the way we have experienced it in our childhood and we felt protected. We felt the warmth of love and care. And even today, we are seeking the same thing again and again and again and again. So when we teach the child that be independent, and the mothers and the fathers say, no, no, the child is five-year-old, six-year-old child. The child should wash his own dishes. She should do her own chores. She should do everything. She should become independent. And by the time she's 13, 16 year old, she should be able to do everything alone. But you are not understanding. You're taking away that beautiful, opportunity from that child where that child can collect these experiences, these memories of love, of share, of care, of pampering. Because in the first few developmental years of the child, the child needs this pampering, this nurturing, this care. Maybe the child knows where to keep the clothes and where to put the things, but still when you as a mother or a father when you give this protection, this nurture and this care, you're forming a positive psychology of love and care. And this, we call it as collective psychology. Because then when you grow up as an adult, you understand. You will understand that I don't function alone in the society. Everyone functions together. There is support of everyone together. I'm not independent, but I am interdependent. There is the philosophy of interdependency in yoga. We don't have the philosophy of being independent. There is a word of self-reliance, means to be confident. But what is mentioned in our scriptures of yoga is the philosophy of interdependency. I was just reading this in the evening, Bhagavad Gita, which is one of our very beautiful scripture. 
and in this it's written that mutually cherishing each other you will attain the highest good when you mutually work when you collectively work you collectively support each other and when i talk about collective psychology it is this understanding if you have received it in your childhood and if you are giving it to your children right now then when they grow up this will be carved this will be ingrained in their memory otherwise i will do alone i can do everything i don't need anybody i don't need any love i don't need any man i don't need any women i'm alone because you know how is our body made when you say this to yourself that i'm alone i can do everything i don't need anybody very unconsciously without you knowing your system goes into a fight and flight mode in science we call it as the sympathetic system your system naturally produces more adrenaline and hormones in excess because you say to yourself i will do it alone i don't need anybody there is a problem i can solve it now the yoga psychology gives you a perspective another perspective your body your liver your heart your brain they are all different organs but they cannot live and work without each other this is your physiological and anatomical psychology there is mutual give and take share and care even within the body even within each cellular structure every cell is communicating with the other cell you don't know you don't know what's happening within the body isn't it all these complex processes which are happening we don't know about it we don't know the process we don't have any knowledge about this but it is happening and it is happening for our good so they are all constantly collaborating communicating and running this system this body and this is our physiological psychology of interdependency so now whenever there is a problem outside and you say i will do it alone which is good you must you are going to do nobody else but when out of egoistical tendency when you say only i will do it and i don't need any support okay, there will be stress produced within the body but when you look at this entire world as a support system and when you can seek help when you can seek support and when you can make proper use of resources you make proper use of resources whatever is there you make use of it and that's why in yoga there is also the concept of a higher intelligence in order to help our psychology because even as a child you knew that mummy is there daddy is there to help me now as adults you say friends are there this world is there things will happen but many a times you will find that people might be limited resources things around could be limited so when you create this psychology of a higher self something higher a source you can rely on 
automatically the brain and the system relaxes. It is psychology. Maybe it's real, it's not real, we don't know. But you are using it as a tool. You are making use of some idea, some concept in order to relax, in order to bring a little bit of happiness, joy, and to surrender. So those who have studied yoga with me, you know Vairagya Bhava. What is Vairagya Bhava? It is an attitude of surrender. Let go. Relax. There is something higher. There is something more intelligent that will take care of these problems. Let me sleep now. So under yoga psychology, there are many, many things discussed that can bring a, bring a refinement in the way you think about yourself and about others, about relationships, about other people in your family, your children. There is a way to look at them. There is a way to think so that your thoughts and your mind support you in your development. You don't want your mind you don't want your thoughts to go against you. You want them to be your friends. And in Bhagavad Gita, in the scripture, it's written that your mind is your greatest enemy. But your mind is also your greatest friend. It depends how you use your mind, how you train your mind. So within yoga psychology, you get this opportunity to explore, to experiment. You don't need to take anything personally. Anything that is written in the scriptures, if you can make use of it for the betterment of the self, then make use. There is nothing to believe or not believe. It is to make use in order to grow and to find some relief. A person without philosophy, a person without this understanding has to face life alone. But you know, within yoga psychology and philosophy as well, the self is also considered to be your greatest friend, when you say alone, I am alone. Now you can look at it in another way. The self is not a limited entity. The self comes from the source. The self comes from that which is infinite and it holds memories and experiences of lifetimes, isn't it? So how can you say that the self is limited, that I am alone, I'm small, I'm weak, I'm failure, I'm a victim. So yoga helps you to change this. And yoga says, you're not a victim, you're not small, you're not a failure. You are that infinite reality that has come from the source, which is powerful, strong, complete in itself. So this is how collectively and individually yoga works on a human mind in order to eradicate suffering. You must not just look at yourself only as an individual. You must also look at yourself as a collective whole. And at the same time, you should also not get stagnant or stuck or attached with the collective whole. But you must also find yourself the way you are. Take both the perspectives. 
you have freedom to take both the pers perspectives without getting attached to any one of it. That is the freedom we have in philosophy. And it's very beautiful when you understand it and when you apply it, you start to see its benefits in your life. That how magically it can work and solve so many problems. And then yoga is the physiological aspect. Of course, we all know a lot about it that how asana means the exercises, the postures can help. How can pranayama help? How can meditation help? A lot of you have already experienced it. So there is this scientific aspect that when you move, turn, twist your spine, your body in a certain way, some chemicals are formed, some hormones are formed, when you put your head down, the hypothalamus gets activated. When you put your hand, ha, head behind, your frontal lobe is activated. So different movements have a different effect on your brain, neurochemicals. Your motor nerves, your sensory nerve fibers, they all are affected. With every movement that you make with conscious awareness. There is a difference when you move your body with awareness and when you move your body without awareness. When you do it with awareness, there will be generation of many different neurochemicals and hormones and secretions and enzymes within the body to help in digestion, to help in your reproductive health, Maybe some women, they make yoga, you make use of yoga for fertility, for reducing de de degeneration, for cancer, for asthma, for cardiac diseases. So we see yoga as therapy as well. But how exercises, when learned in a scientific way, when you understand how to breathe with every movement, and how to make every movement in coordination with other sensory organs. So we call this as neuromuscular education in yoga. So the physiological yoga has the neuromuscular aspect within it. Because you cannot just say that you're moving muscles. You're moving your body. No. It is neuromuscular. There is brain involved. And every time you're making a movement, there is judgment, there is balance, there is your intelligence, there is your memory, isn't it? There is the breath, so many processes which are directly connected to your brain, neurological. So, Yoga can heal you deeply within, deep inside your nervous system, your brain, and thereby bringing a complete total healing of the physical body. And many diseases which are psychosomatic in nature, psycho means because of the mind, mental. Because of the mind, the body is suffering and vice versa, physiopsychological and psychophysiological. So when you understand your body and mind through yoga, you can bring this healing as well. The last, as I told you, is yoga as lifestyle now. When time management comes in, routine management comes in, how should I sleep? When should I wake up? What kind of food should I eat? The plant-based diet, which we also call it as the alkaline diet or sattvic diet. Alkaline means coming only from plants. Does not make your blood acidic. It keeps your blood alkaline. 
So when you have a plant-based food, when you have a certain lifestyle, certain habits, a routine, then diseases, whether they are physical or mental, you can heal them. And for that, you have to change your food habits. You have to change yourself through certain disciplines, routine and time, how to spend my day. All this that is discussed under lifestyle. So now when we look at yoga with these four perspectives, one, yoga is philosophy to help you change your view towards world. If you feel right now angry, you feel irritated, bitter, you're feeling, look at this world, horrible world and horrible people, nobody is of use, then study yoga philosophy. It will help you a lot. Today, our teenagers, their children, and then when they grow up, we all grow up, we are suffering from this negative impact of this society and also positive impacts, but we want the negative impacts to reduce bit by bit. And for that take support of yoga philosophy. Okay. Have two or three different viewpoints. If somebody asks me, are you a theist or an atheist? I would answer that sometime when it suits me, I become an atheist. And when it suits me, at other times I become a theist. Because you're free to look at life in different perspectives if it's helping you sometimes. So make use of various philosophies. And within yoga philosophy, there's so many different sub philosophies as well. Then yoga psychology to understand the self, the collective whole and the self how you are separate and also you are connected to so understand this part. So that our egoistical behavior reduces and we can make full use of all the resources which are available to us. Because of our egoistical tendencies, we are not able to make use of the resources. We are not able to make use of the nature, of the people, of the world, because there is this ego. I can do everything. I don't need you. Now, don't have this kind of psychology. Have a collective psychology. At the same time, understand yourself. And then, as I told you, yoga with its physiological concepts of asana, pranayama, meditation as well is a very in-depth study. The process of meditation, the different parts of meditation, it is quite systematic study of meditation because many a times we think meditation is just sit, close your eyes, but technically what are the things that you must know? And how can meditation bring a healing within the self? And then yoga is lifestyle, where you change your food habits. You change your routine. You change your small little habits in your day-to-day -day life, in your routine. Okay. So this is the summary that how yoga can heal with the macro and micro influences. <laughs> this was something mentioned in the poster. So what are the macro influences? You have macro influences on your self. Macro means this weather, the movement of the sun and the moon. It has an influence on the body. When the sun rises, there is an effect on the body, isn't it? 
the weather, when it's hot and cold, there is an effect on the body. So these are all macro influences. And yoga helps you to understand these macro influences. Because many a times you don't have a control, a total control over the macro influences. The planetary influence, the influence of the ocean, of the space, of the air, there is an influence on our entire body, our mind. So certain parts that we are not able to control, then how can we manage this without suffering? This is what yoga helps us. And micro-influences. Micro-influences are something that are mostly within your control. So the desires that you have, have an impact on your secretions of the body. Some very strong desire will generate a lot of chemicals, isn't it? So micro influences are your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your desires, you, the way you look at yourself, the way you think about yourself are micro influences. And both this macro and micro influences could be now managed with the help of yoga by understanding yoga as philosophy, psychology, physiology, and lifestyle. Okay. I hope that in these few minutes, which was less than 60 minutes, I have tried to explain you Look at yoga beyond the mat. Look at yoga in a more holistic way where there is education, where there is analysis, there is some scope to develop something more creative. Okay. I'm not against asana, but when you make a huge intellectual system, a cultural, traditional intellectual system into a circus, into a small little part, into just physical movements. And when you glorify only that part, then we miss on so many other aspects of yoga, isn't it? So I think, friends, we are now in this time where we should look at yoga with a wider perspective. We should try to be open to explore and understand, and study and learn. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for listening. It was indeed a very nice class. I would... Um, give you some time if in case you have something to share, ask, say something. And, you know, I don't know how many of you are with me, how many of you are with Mileni, but feel free to just switch on your mic and say something. <laughs> Gina? I don't know. If, hello. Let's see if there is some question. There is a question here from Kawana. Do you have any books to recommend on yoga lifestyle? And we then you this. can answer, Gina, and then, of course, speak about our course. Okay, okay. I forgot that. It's important. Thank you. But no questions apart from this? Okay, book, I will give you a book. Jana quer falar. Jana tem uma pergunta. Yes. Oi, bom dia. Eu queria saber como começar esse estudo, como, como começar no yoga de uma forma diferente do, do tapetinho que a gente comum, comumente conhece, né? Para ter essa filosofia, para ter esse conhecimento todo. Como começar para quem nunca fez nada, para quem nunca estudou? 
Ok. Coloca no mudo. Não entendi tudo. Por ah, favor. Just a second. Ok. A pergunta da Jana, Jana asked, Gina, how to start to study yoga in this wider, with this wider perspective? How can she start studying like more profoundly yoga? You can start studying with me. <laughs> I will give her a little insight about our course and a book that could be helpful for yoga lifestyle is our book from our school. Where did it go? Here. You know, Millennia, I wanted to send a few books over there. There is this book, Yoga of Caring, which is from our school, isn't it? And this is a very nice book of our school. I will try to post some copies to Milani for all the Brazilian people. And because it's only available in India, not internationally. So I will post it in case if you want it. Yoga is lifestyle, which is unfortunately not discussed in many, many, almost, I would say all the teacher trainings, very little part of lifestyle is discussed. Diet is the most important. Nutrition and diet and lifestyle are very important. Yes, any other questions? Did you guys enjoy the lecture? Was it useful? Anything that you learned that was useful? What was useful to you in this lecture? Shiva Pritam Kaur. Wow, this is quite an Indian name. From where is this person? I'm grateful for opportunity to participate. Can you repeat the word about surrender? First of all, where are you, Shiva? Where are you? I'm not able to see you. I'm here. Oh, wow. This, you know, is very magical, this Zoom online things. Sometimes <laughs> people are there not there and then suddenly they appear okay <laughs> Shiva. <laughs> thank you so, i you am enjoy? kundalini yoga teacher very nice okay. very brazil. in which country uh, i am from brazil very nice so surrender surrender in sanskrit we call at Call it as Vairagya. Yeah, you may note it down. Vairagya. Not Vairagi. Vairagya. Vairagya can also be understood as an attitude. And that's why it also comes under psychology of yoga. Like, I'll give you an example of Vairagya. I have given maybe in some of the classes. Uh, maybe someone needs to mute. Yeah, okay. you, you, Milani, you just. Oh, okay. So, you know, these birds which fly from Scandinavian countries they migrate to Asian countries during certain seasons. And they have to cover a huge distance sometimes, very long distance from countries like Norway and Finland. They come 
to Asia, especially during winters. And they stay for a few months. And then after a few months, they go back to their Scandinavian countries. These are migratory birds. And you know, sometimes we as human beings, we think we are very, very intelligent, which is good. We should be positive about ourselves, but we forget. We forget about the divinity which is there in the higher intelligence. You look at that little ant, the ant is very intelligent. It knows exactly how to survive in this world. You know, they were there today in my kitchen. And you don't know from where they come, what they do, what is their purpose over here and why they're in my kitchen. But they are there in the kitchen. So you look at the honey bees and so many animals, even amoeba, small little viruses. Look at this COVID virus. All these are very intelligent. They are vibrating with intelligence. When birds can migrate from so far without Google Maps, imagine how intelligent they should be. When we start to look at the world, the other creatures and living beings with this understanding that intelligence is something which is given to everybody. It is a part of this living world and not only restricted to human beings. This brings a feeling of egolessness. And then all the guards and shields that we have, we are protecting ourselves from many guards and shields because we don't want to be foolish. We don't want to be stupid. We don't want to be a failure. We don't want to be weak. All this artificial guards and shields, they drop off because you start to see this intelligence in everything, everywhere. This higher state of understanding which brings about egolessness, we call it as vairagya in yoga language, in Sanskrit. Yoga is taught in Sanskrit. So we must know Sanskrit. I know, but I cannot teach in Sanskrit to you, so I translate it. But in the teacher training, when you go through, you will develop a strong, very strong foundational vocabulary of the important Sanskrit words which you must know, okay, bit by bit, which will help you to connect to many complex subjects of yoga. Okay, so this is Vairagya. Yes, I hope I have answered your question, Shiva. Very nice name. It was extremely useful for me. I really enjoyed it. The part about yoga psychology talked to me the most. Thank you, Kauna. And Katya is writing in Portuguese. Okay, okay, Melanie. Great. So a little bit about our course, because we are trying to spread that study traditional yoga. Traditional yoga is classical yoga, which comes from the ancient Vedas, the Vedic system. Of course, there are so many yogas right now, which are very recent, 20 years old, 30 years old. But we want to understand yoga from its roots and go to the most authentic scriptures and study every sentence from that authentic scriptures bit by bit so that you get the whole picture of yoga. So yoga should be understood through scriptures, original scriptures, authentic scriptures, not coming from me, not coming from anyone, coming from the tradition, from the lineage. 
how many years old lineage? I don't know. It could be 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 old lineage. Okay. But the recent one, which I know the dates, is 5,000 years old, the scripture that I teach that is related to philosophy. And then one more recent, which is 1,000 years old, Hatha Yoga. I think most of you pronounce Hatha Yoga as Hatha. It is not Hatha, it is Hatha Yoga. It is the most recent. How much? 1,000 years old, Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga got its name from Tantra. There was nothing as Hatha Yoga. It got its name from Tantra. Are there any Tantra masters now? There are, but the ones that you're seeing on the internet, please be careful of them. But the masters no longer are available to the society. They live in isolation. They are not interested to reveal anything from the Tantra because they know things will be damaged, commercialized, marketed in a wrong way and taught in a wrong way as well. So we will then study the most recent yoga, which is 1000 years old, when it comes to the physiological aspect. When it comes to the philosophical aspect, we will study scriptures which are from 5000 to infinite dates old. Fortunately, I have access to some scriptures and the original language to yoga which I very much look forward to share to some people who would value, understand, and spread this message to the world, okay. and thereby bringing a change as well. In my past, having done a lot of uh, social work through yoga, I would like everybody to also take up this kind of a life where not only career professionally, but also socially, you uplift everyone as well. So Millennia will let them know, Vanessa as well here, Daniela or Kara, those who want information about the course. Since several years, since past 15 years, I have been teaching yoga in different ways, in teacher trainings and workshops, therapy. I'm a licensed therapist. I teach yoga with therapy and medical specifics. I've worked with doctors and also helped their patients in healing as well. Worked in different various ways to help people heal. So I have designed a training program, which most of the people know it as 200 hours teacher training. That is just a transactional name, but the content is very important. So I have developed this program, but since COVID-19, I re-summarized it. I went through the curriculum and the syllabus again so that you don't miss anything from it. And also updated several things which were important from years of experience and have designed this two months online course. It is six times in a week where you will meet us for one and a half hour per day. And it will go on continuously for two months. And those who want to understand yoga from all the perspectives, it will be given to you in totality. You will not miss anything. The scientific aspect, the philosophical, the psychological aspect, everything would be given so that after this foundational course, you can go ahead to finish your yoga therapy. Of course, the certificate is international, very, very credible with many, many you know, uh, bodies who have authorized. If you're in Europe, UK, Brazil, America, anywhere in the world, it will be accepted because of the credibility of our institute. So why is Living Yoga Academy? 
is credited by the government of India as well, Yoga Alliance USA as well. And wherever you submit our curriculum, it is accepted without any doubt, including the therapy as well. I am the teacher, <laughs> the co-founder, and taking care of a lot of things within the Institute. And I have a team of my wonderful colleagues as well helping me. So 10th of January, I think, yes, the course will start. You're most welcome to join the course. If at all you have any concerns, any doubts, any queries about the course, about the fees, about the timings, recordings, feel free to contact us. So I hope that was a nice way to end. Zoom user, who are you? I'm not able to see you <laughs> and your name as well. Thank you for coming. Hi, sorry, it's, uh, it's Natalie. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I was messing around with my Zoom the other day and I accidentally took my name off so and I can't figure out how to put my name back on so I do apologise. No problem but <laughs> but nice to hear your voice. Welcome <laughs> thank you. and thank you so much Natalie. Thank you. Okay great friends uh, I had a beautiful evening with all of you look forward to see you maybe in the course or keep coming to the lectures we have almost one lecture free every week. So please do join and keep studying, learning, working together. Okay, thank you very much. Let us end with home chanting. Hi, Daniela, also there. Thank you, Cynthia. Great. Let us end with one Om chanting. Close your eyes and take a nice deep breath in to make your transition into other activity. Just a second. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Just to, before you finish, because there is some people asking about the course, I'm gonna give my Instagram for people get in touch with me. So, então aqueles Aqui no Brasil, que quiserem saber mais sobre o curso, por favor, entrem em contato comigo. Meu Instagram é Yoga na Vida. Eu vou colocar aqui para vocês, tá bom? Será um prazer ter vocês conosco. Thank you very much, Gina. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. And those who want to get in touch, uh, you can get in touch with me through Wise Living Yoga Academy. But then let me know also whether you're coming through your teacher, anybody who sent you over here, like maybe Daniela, Cara, Vanessa, you can write directly or you can contract your teachers as well. So let us end with one Om chanting. Close your eyes and again, take nice deep breath in. Relax. Breathe. Release the tension and relax. Think of something nice and beautiful to end the class. Oh. Shanti 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 Hari Om Great. Namaste. Have a beautiful day or night. See you next time. Namaste. Thank you, Gino. <laughs> Thank Have you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.